Android N is here, but they're not telling what the N stands for. Facebook users are not all dying yet. And we break down those secret charges on your cell phone bill. All that and a whole lot more on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1466, recorded Wednesday, March 9th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash TNT. And by FreshBooks, the super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of freelancers and small businesses the tools to save time and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash TNT. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about every piece of tech news uh, in the world. All of them. All two and a half of them today. Mm -hmm. With people who love technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just with ourselves. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but it's a good thing we love technology. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am Megan Maroney. And I am Jason Howell. Uh, we have no full episode guest today, but have no fear. We have a couple of guests flying in a little bit later. Uh, Kurt Wagner from Recode and Russell Hawley from Android Central. Talk about a few cool things, mm -hmm. technology related, because that's what we do here. Yes. Uh, but before that, we've got some other things to talk about before we get to all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's start here. As we stand by and we witness the slow march to our collective demise, with AI proving time and time again that it's smarter than we are, important things happen behind closed doors. And by closed doors, I mean, uh, well, I'm sure there was at least one closed door somewhere in the room <laughs> when Google's AlphaGo program beat the world champion Go player, Lee C. Dole. Um, this was the first of five matches. And this was this is the kind of thing that, like, even a couple of months ago, uh, researchers were predicting might not even happen in the next decade, yet it's happened now. So this is obviously a big turning point, seen as a big turning point for AI. Of course, there are four more matches to go, but coming right out of the gate and beating the world champion Go player, and Go is by by no means an easy game for a computer to win. They really had to go uh, in, in a, a few different kind of directions with neural networks in order to kind of crack this nut. Yeah, they didn't just use neural networks. They also used Monte Carlo tree search. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of that. That involves choosing moves at random and then simulating the game to the very end to find a winning strategy. Dang. So things that, you know, you don't know. I love that computers can do this, and I'm terrified that computers can do this. Literally millions of possible moves in, in Go, which is why this is such a programming kind of um, feat. Along with that, there, um, what I was reading is two kind of other neural networks working hand in hand. There's the policy network, which is basically that that neural network is always looking uh, at the collection of the best moves based on where they're at right now. So the, the challenge here is not analyzing every single possible move on the board because that stretches into the millions and that's just impossible to do um, do effectively. So this just kind of narrows it down to some of the best moves that are nearby and then a values network that um, kind of limits the search depth. So it's only thinking, you know, just 20 moves ahead. That's all. Just 20 moves ahead. No big deal. That's how I'm always thinking. <laughs> I know. Man, when I play Go, I'm at least 30 moves ahead. So I have a feeling I could beat this computer. Yeah, I don't play I've never Go. played Go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. Tony Wang uh, is, you know, one of our supervising producers and he has played. He tried to explain it to me today uh, how to play and I couldn't even. I was like, thank you for so much, but you're hurting it's, my brain. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of like, well, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain without and, and mind you, I have not played it. So I've just done a lot of reading and seeing videos, but basically more or less of the two different colored kind of uh, pegs on the board, you're trying to surround the other, you know, the other player essentially, mm -hmm. and kind of that renders that 
uh, player out of you know out of the game for that particular uh, piece. Um, and then doing that across the wide scale of the board, which it's a huge board. Like you can see when you see the board, how how big it is and all, you know, just how many spaces there are that, um, you know, stretched out. You can understand why there are really millions of ways you can go with this. Um, I think what I'm fascinated with by this is if researchers and people thinking about AI up until even the last couple of months thought that this would not happen and, you know, maybe for another 10 years, and it is, what other things seem impossible right now that we're going to see happen thanks to things like neural networks and AI in the course of the next couple of years? Like, that's kind of crazy. Now, obviously, this is a game. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if we're over, you know, overemphasizing uh, it when it's just a game, but it's a game that proves a very kind of scientific and mathematical challenge. And it was, I mean pretty impressive what it's done in a short amount of time. I wonder what this means for other kind of, quote, impossible problems going forward. Yeah, it's exciting. Did you ever see the movie Deep Blue Sea? Uh, no, I have heard of it, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite line in almost any movie where they're just like, it's a shark with, you know, a brain in it. And it's like, the shark gets smarter. <sighs> It's and getting smarter. So anytime any of these stories, I keep hearing that the shark got smarter. If you haven't seen it, it's not a great movie. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a great really good, bad scene. movie. <laughs> okay. Hey, I've, I've got so, a handful of those yeah, in, in my I arsenal as well. Uh, this is definitely this generation's uh, Kasparov versus, uh, well, Deep Blue, mm -hmm. uh, which was the world championship uh, chess player versus IBM's Deep Blue machine. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of seen as a big step uh, for computers. And hey, here we are. Not very much longer later, 15, 17 years, something like that, later. And uh, yeah, even bigger challenge has been defeated. Maybe next will be Monopoly. <laughs> I think, wow, that, that would be something. I'll believe it when I see it. All right, let's move on. YouTube co-founder Steve Chen launched his newest venture today. It's called NOM. And think of it as personal live streaming meets food Instagram. Now, these are both two things that I personally hate. Oh. <laughs> Not a fan of food Instagrams or live streaming, but NOM itself is not so bad. It's a mix of professional chefs and average people live streaming their own cooking experiences. Uh, I think we can take a look maybe at a live stream that's going on right now or is something there one that's going recorded. Because yeah, I was on the site trying to find hey guys, something and I had a really hard time like finding any live con here uh, content. In Russian Hill, this is Francesca. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm so. coming over to start to make my dinner. Everybody just Ryan thinks they're such home. good cooks. And they start with the obligatory, hey guys. Uh huh. That's pretty much a standard, the de facto standard with live streaming on the internet these days is the starting with the hey guys. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody has to eat and uh, it's fun to cook new meals. And I uh, don't do that well. So, I might try this. I, I'm wondering if we're, because we're, this really what this is to me, especially when you consider the app, there's an iOS app. And it basically allows you, you know, it has an interface, lets you do things like you're seeing here. You can upload, you can, uh, you can mix kind of different content together, um, you know, photos, videos, uh, GIFs, all that kind of stuff into your live show. Uh, it has two-way interaction. So, like, you're, you're chatting with the people that are watching your live cooking show. Uh, multi-camera capabilities if you have the technology to kind of back that up. And some of the screenshots that I saw, it really just seems like a Periscope or yeah, like once, what was once Meerkat, right. rest in peace. Um, you know, but for, for cooking, it makes me wonder if this is like where we're going is, is live, uh, you know, startups around live video for certain specific things like cooking mm -hmm. or home improvement or, you know, whatever. Right. I yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, when when you use the phrase cooking show, like let's cooking show it. That's what we've always used in TV. It means like you go back, you, you make the meal beautifully, you mess it up, you spill everything, everything's really messy. And then, you know, you cut and then you take it out of the oven and here's my beautiful thing that I just <laughs> made. So that's taking that out of it. This is uh -huh. definitely more authentic because I know, you know, if you ever look Grassroot, at anything yeah. on anything on Pinterest, like anything that you're going to make, like a cupcake shaped like a panda bear or something. I don't know anyone who has ever tried to make their children cupcakes that they see on Pinterest knows it usually ends up horribly. 
pretty pretty much anything I ever see on Pinterest. If I've ever tried, thought to myself, oh, I could totally do that. That yeah. looks pretty easy. Right. No, I'm going to destroy it. Yes. And uh, I'm happy to hear that I'm not the only one. So I like the idea that you can really see it live streaming. So if they mess yeah. up, if it's actually hard to do what they're doing, you know, then you can act really see it's more authentic. <laughs> Salt so we're going to see a lot chips. more burnt meals yes, uh, in exactly. these kind of cooking shows. I hope. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I like the idea. And, you know, it is from YouTube, uh, one of YouTube's co-founders, so it's got a lot of funding, $4.7 million. Some of the investors including include Cy, oh, yeah. Style, Montgomery and style. Jared Leto, and some mm. others. So, yeah, I don't a lot know of money if, behind it. I don't know if hearing that Cy's behind it makes me feel better or worse about the product. No, those were the t only two names I, I <laughs> recognize. The other two are impressive yeah. investors. So, yeah, I and think... And some famous cooks. Everyone has to stuff. eat. Uh, live streaming, people... That's the other thing with cooking shows. Lots of people watch cooking yeah, shows and love never shows. cook the things. It's mm -hmm. like video. It's like Twitch. You know, people, it's, a lot of people might watch the video mm -hmm. and then not actually play the video game. It's, just enjoy watching people play video games. Yeah, it's like, it's like food porn. I yeah. hate to put it like that, but I mean, that's, yeah, that's really people love watching people making good looking food. Mm -hmm. That's why I wonder how this is going to do. Cause I wonder how good looking the food is going to actually be the quality of that, whatever. Uh, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, and we live stream. So we you do. don't, you don't totally hate live streaming. No, I don't. <laughs> I, it's true. And you get to see, sometimes we you get to see us mess up. And sometimes that is the best part, seeing yeah. us mess up. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Right. I mean, we're Might gonna... not seem like it to us at the time, but some people right. like to watch that. I mean, later stuff. we'll edit out when you said food porn, because you're not allowed to say porn Apparently, on this show. But I didn't know that. You're live streaming, until you get to see it. Now. <laughs> just kidding. There you go. All right, moving on, because this could get weird. <laughs> President Obama announced Connect All today. It's a broadband initiative that aims to bring broadband connectivity to the underserved in the U.S. The goal is to reach 20 million more Americans by 2020 with broadband access that might not have had access otherwise. It's, uh, you know, one, one component of this, of course, is yesterday's news. Uh, the FCC, you know, announced the monthly broadband subsidy as part of the kind of lifeline redux. There, there are other pieces of this, which include recycling old government computers for use in lower income households. Um, they're improving their efforts with libraries to kind of help build digital literacy. So uh, this is basically the White House kind of backing uh, what the FCC was doing, which mind you, they're, they're separate, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're separate efforts, but the, uh, the White House is kind of tagging onto it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it is a good question. Does everyone deserve broadband? Is that like a human right? I feel like it is. Yeah. I feel like if you don't have broadband in this day and age, and I, sure, I'm sure region may have something to do with that, but I mean, here in the United States, like, wow, are you really kind of behind the curve? Like, I think that eliminates you from so many opportunities to just do things like live a comfortable life where you're making a decent wage and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's so ingrained into our culture uh, now that, yeah, I almost feel like it's, I mean, obviously we're not going to die if we don't have access to the internet, but it certainly uh, degrades our quality of life in certain ways. Absolutely. And the homework gap, which we talked about last night is mm -hmm. true. I mean, all my kids' homework is on Google Docs. You know, they, ha right. they have to have it. Mm -hmm. And libraries have it, of course. So you could go to the library. It's not open. Our library is not open past 6 o'clock when anyone's doing homework. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely uh, think this is a great. Uh, I, I'm happy to hear that. And along this topic, we got an email from Rusty who wrote, I ran an IT department for a public library, and I'm very familiar with government funding, specifically the Universal Service Fund. I just wanted to offer what I believe is a correction to what Becky Worley said in regards to the Lifeline program. She mentioned the amount she saw on her bill. However, that amount is not all for the Lifeline program. In fact, what you see in her bill is the Universal Service Fund. And the proposed budget increase is solely to fund the Lifeline program, not the Universal Service Fund as a whole. And what the Universal Service Fund goes to is actually three different federal programs, only one of which is Lifeline. Another is a program called E-Rate. E-Rate mainly provides internet to schools and libraries. So to use Becky's example of a 50 cent increase to Lifeline on her bill would be a five, would have, that would be five cents. So I would actually only be 50% of one third of what is on her bill. And that's not to say that's not a lot of money. However, it's not exactly what she thought it was. Uh, so that was a discussion we were having yeah. last night. And Becky looked on her bill and she said, you know, that that every I have to pay that for everyone. Uh, so, yeah, that's interesting there. I looked this up and it, 
it is accurate. The Universal Service Fund is the Connect America Fund, which is formerly known as High Cost Support. That's for rural areas. Lifeline, which we've already talked about. Schools and libraries, E-rate, which he mentioned, and also rural health care. So... Um, maybe that illustrates just kind of a point then uh, about this. Cause I know for me, I'm happy to pay it if it, if these kinds of things amount to actual change and, you know, is that a lot of money to me? It's not, I can understand that, you know, my situation is different from other people and their, their situations might be different, but maybe what this says more than anything is that it's hard for the general person to look at their bill and know exactly what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe there needs to be an easier way for people to understand that that money is going to these, you know, these programs and what those programs actually are. And all you really have to do, I suppose, is go on the internet and focus on it and, you know, and really look to research into it. But I think a lot of people would be happy to spend, to put a couple of dollars uh, into something like that if they just knew what it was. Yeah. It's interesting that you use the example of going on the internet and looking. I know, right. <laughs> like that's what, that wouldn't work in this case. <laughs> well, I mean, well, the people might. paying yeah, for it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, but that's true. It's like, that's what we say. Like, we'll just Google right. it. Just, you know, right. do whatever. So, uh, so I looked at the FCC site. They, they, from the site, it says some consumers may notice a universal service line item on their telephone bills. This line item appears when a company chooses to recover the USF contributions directly from its customers by billing them this charge. The FCC does not require this charge to be passed on to customers. I thought this was interesting. Each company makes a business decision about whether and how to assess charges to recover its universal service costs. So that says it depends on the on the company. The New York Times actually says the fund comes from line item charges to every wireless phone bill. So I'm not even, I mean, this is obviously confusing. The New York Times says something differently, different than the FCC says. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to these kinds of things confusing me because when you look at bills and you see all these line items, that's part of me, like the, the kind of snarky side of me just assumes that it's it's that way for a reason. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think it is. I think it and is that's, to confuse And that's kind you. of unfortunate, especially when you're talking about something that's actually going to do a lot of people a lot of good. Right. So, well, thanks, Rusty, for yeah. writing in. Uh, you can email us at tnt at twit.tv if you uh, want to suggest a correction or just have any feedback on our show. There we go. Love hearing from you guys. All right. Coming up, Facebook goes all in on faces. But first... <laughs> Let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Ring Video Doorbell. We've all grown up with the sound of a doorbell. We know what it sounds like. It means a package is being delivered. Friends are coming over for dinner. It means someone's pushing the button at your front door because it's a doorbell. It also means the sound of someone planning to rob you. Over 95% of home break-ins happen during the day, and burglars almost always start by ringing your doorbell to see if someone's home before they pillage through your possessions. With the Ring Video Doorbell, you can see and talk to anyone from your door or at your door from wherever you happen to be in the world. Even if you're at a different door, you can still talk to them at this door, as long as you have your smartphone with you. Ring's advanced motion detection alerts you even if someone doesn't ring the doorbell. With the Ring Video Doorbell, you can talk to delivery people, keep an eye on the package that they drop off. If someone tries to mess around with it or, I don't know, take it, you're going to get an instant alert and HD video of the entire thing in the cloud. It's like a neighbor keeping an eye on your home 24-7. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Ring Video Doorbell. I have it installed at our front door. Uh, it did not take me long at all to install. It's actually <laughs> pretty darn easy to install. And it has the rechargeable battery underneath, which is perfect for me because uh, we don't have the wiring to kind of, you know, it, for a power doorbell. So I just recharge it, put, uh, put it on the wall, and it runs awesome. I don't even have to think about it anymore. Put your mind at ease and protect your home with the video doorbell Time Magazine and USA Today named one of their top 10 gadgets. Go to ring.com slash TNT for free expedited FedEx shipping. That's ring.com slash TNT. With Ring, you're always home. Thank you, Ring. Three years ago, Facebook offered $3 billion to buy Snapchat. Snapchat didn't bite, so ever since then, Facebook has been trying to replicate their best features. For example, puking rainbow selfies. Oh, that is the best feature ever. <laughs> that is the best feature of Snapchat. I mean, and we are Snapchat <laughs> experts. Joining totally. us to Joining us to talk about this is Kurt Wagner from Recode. Welcome, Kurt. Hey, how are you guys doing? Awesome. Doing good. So tell us about today's acquisition, today's acquisition by Facebook. Sure. So Facebook bought a uh, company called Masquerade today. And what Masquerade does is it 
takes uh, it has some cool technology that lets you transform your face uh, when you're taking a selfie into all these you know weird kind of silly silly different things. Um, I think you saw the Leonardo DiCaprio one. Uh, okay, here we go. We got a, a nice little mon- monkey face going on there. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a very fun thing that I think maybe even a few years ago people might have written off. But um, what's interesting about this is that Snapchat has similar technology built into its app, and it is super popular. Uh, a lot of people use it, including the, the puking rainbow thing that you guys were mentioning that uh, made the rounds a few months ago. And so uh, this seems like a pretty clear sign that Facebook is trying to capture a little bit of the magic that Snapchat has has proven works with its audience. Well, I think that, you know, those rainbow puking selfies were what a lot of people, what made them install Snapchat in the first place. I mean, anyone, you know, people over the age of 15, I think, were like, what's that? I need to figure that out. And then they posted it on Twitter. I don't, I want to know what's so fascinating. This and also the face swapping apps where you can like swap your face with someone else. Oh, they're so much fun. What is so fascinating about that? (laughs) We, we had folks in our office just, uh, yeah, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, everyone was kind of face swapping with each other and no, it was new. Everyone was like, what the heck is this? And, uh, you know, if you haven't ever used Snapchat before, maybe you would see someone do that and think, oh, that might be worth trying out. So I can see this as kind of like a new user play. So do we have any idea how Facebook is going to use it? Are they going to use it? Is they going to use it with Instagram or Facebook? Do we have any idea? We don't really know the details. I think those are both uh, logical fits. I think Instagram especially is a logical mm-hmm. fit. They're going to keep Masquerade as a standalone app, so it's not going to shut down. It's still going to operate. My guess is eventually they take the technology and they you know, fold it into Messenger, Instagram, uh, definitely Facebook, and, and try to get these kinds of goofy photos all over their uh, platform like they do with a lot of the other stuff they buy. Yeah, it really does feel like more of a fit for Instagram, just in the sense that Instagram, you know, you, you probably, well, I, I guess you have people, you know, doing the selfie thing on Facebook, but Instagram's really a lot more focused on the picture, you know, on the mobile photos specifically. So I could completely see that as a good fit. Facebook Definitely. is a younger audience as well, isn't it? Is that true? Facebook or? Uh, Instagram, Instagram is. Instagram, in, Instagram yeah. is. Instagram is think- younger than Facebook, but probably <laughs> Snapchat is younger than Instagram. I think that's fair. Uh, I think Snapchat and Instagram have a lot of overlap in their mm-hmm. audience. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't think you're going to see a lot of, uh, m- not as many older folks, you know, grandparents especially, who are going to be on Instagram or Snapchat. Whereas I think a lot of grandparents have, have adopted Facebook over the last couple of years. So um, I don't know that to be, uh, I don't have the hard numbers in front of me. I think that's a pretty safe bet, though. Yeah. So, what other ways is Facebook trying to be more like Snapchat? <laughs> well, the two the two companies are, are uh, battling very hard over video views. That's kind of the metric that they like to both throw out there and compare with one another. Um, so in terms of how are they kind of competing right now, I think that's maybe the most obvious example. But twice in the past now, Facebook has built standalone apps that were all about ephemeral disappearing messages. And uh, one was called Poke. Uh, that was maybe three years ago yeah, uh, or so. Then they came out with Slingshot, and uh, that was maybe a year and a half ago, and neither stuck. They both were essentially busts, and both of them at the time were kind of like, here's Facebook's you know, Snapchat killer, and voila, nothing, uh, nothing came of it. So this is the, the next in a long line of Facebook attempts to kind of mimic what Snapchat has been able to do, and so far they haven't been able to do it. I don't, I, I don't think that this is necessarily going to kill Snapchat and, uh, at all either. I think what it does is it just simply shows kind of Facebook's desperation to figure out what's working for them and, and try to, you know, stay up to speed with what Snapchat has going on. It does seem like they need to have a, they, a younger audience. I mean, eventually, we'll all, all of those of us that use Facebook will, you know, die, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> We're, you know, you paint mean, a dire picture, Megan. Very bright, cheerful episode. Today. It really is. I know this is sad, but you you know what I'm saying. We'll eventually age out. If it's if grandparents are on Facebook sure. and parents are on Facebook, but then kids, but maybe kids just eventually all go to Facebook because they have to for. I mean, may, maybe fa- maybe Facebook at that point is something completely different than what it is right now. Because yeah. that's a really long time for a right. company to be just locked in as just a social network. Mm-hmm. And I think Facebook has greater ambitions than that anyways. You know, they really want to be a Google uh, by and large. So, mm-hmm. 
so yeah, I think if that's the case, if it's really that long, you know, here uh, in existence for that long, I think it's a completely you know different product by then. Good point. Yeah, so- I agree. I gotta agree with Jason there. I think they they are thinking. If, if we still have the same social network five years down the road, something went wrong. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, I, granted, I probably would have said that five years ago, too. And here we are. They're pretty, pretty similar. So uh, maybe I maybe I am wrong. But I think there's this definitely this feeling for all tech companies, especially for a Facebook and a Snapchat, that if you're not always constantly changing and, and trying to, uh, you know, lure those first time Internet users, those 14, 15 year olds, uh, you're going to fall behind pretty quickly. So I, I, I'm sure that they'll be uh, iterating quickly. Yeah, you're going to be MySpace is what you are. You'll be MySpace, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so Facebook is trying to be more like Snapchat, and you wrote today that Facebook-owned Instagram is trying to be more like Facebook. Explain what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah, so Instagram uh, is starting to look a lot like Facebook from a business perspective. So uh, they're starting to roll out a lot of the same advertising uh, techniques and features that Facebook already has. Um, what I wrote about this morning were a few small things that they're working on, uh, business profiles and uh, essentially the ability to kind of gather insights into how their posts that are not ads are doing. So basically, if I put a, uh, you know, just a, a photo up, I'm a brand and I put a photo up, but I'm not paying uh, for it to be an advertisement. As of right now, I can't really see how well that post does without, you know, with the exception of just how many likes that it gets or how many comments. Uh, so Facebook wants to encourage brands to post more often, uh, and they want to make it easier for them to, to buy advertising. And so if they make their ad products feel like Facebook ad products, which a lot of these advertisers are familiar with, they think it's going to make it easier and, and they're going to make more money that way. So not at all surprising, especially since Facebook owns Instagram, mm-hmm. but I think it is worth kind of noting and, and, and seeing how similar the two uh, pathways have been so far. So how do Facebook's numbers compare to Instagram's numbers? Well, if you're talking uh, users, Facebook has you know 1.5 billion plus users uh, each month, more than a billion users every day. Instagram, I want to say the last time they shared numbers publicly were 400 million MAU uh, monthly active users. So, you know, it's about... Uh, gosh, only what would that be? 25% the size of Facebook right now uh, from an MAU perspective, which seems really small, but 400 million is a lot of people. Um, and so I think, you know, if we're talking revenue wise, we don't really know how big uh, Instagram's business is because Facebook doesn't break it out. There's a lot of people that are speculating that within the next few years, it could be, you know, a $5 billion per year business, that'd be Instagram alone, not including Facebook, which is already making somewhere like 17 or 18 billion last year. So if that's true, I mean, holy smokes, they got a, they kind of have Facebook 2.0 on their hands right now with Instagram, um, or at least that's how a lot of people see it. We'll see if it actually plays out that way, but we don't know much about their business. We do know it's about a quarter of the size though. Well, Kurt, thank you, as always. It is a pleasure to have you on and have your uh, unique perspective on all things Facebook, Twitter, social, Instagram, period. all the things, and the next thing. So, <laughs> all of it. I'm looking forward to the face swap episode where you guys uh, Let's do it. Know, swap faces for the whole time. That'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I definitely thank you. Thank you so much. Kurt Wagner is a Thanks reporter. Thanks for the idea. We'll yeah, <laughs> we'll no problem. Definitely. Take care. Thanks for having me. Guys. All Thanks right, take so care. much. Kurt's, of course, at Recode and at Kurt Wagner 8 on Twitter. That's right. Mm-hmm. All right. TNT's fan of the day is Tony Hannity's, who says it's, quote, always fun to visit the live tapings here at Twit. Fans of All About Android, which is another show I do on the network, know Tony. He's been on uh, as a guest a handful of times, and he drops in uh, for live shows on occasion. So thanks to Tony. And you can do that too, by the way. If you want to drop in, uh, you can actually send an email to tickets at twit.tv. Let us know you want to sit in on a show, and we'll actually reserve a seat for you. No big deal. As for being a fan of the day... Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT, and we love those too. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it to Instagram, Google+, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you got, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. After the break, is it Android Nutella? Android Nerds? Mm. Android Nutter Butters? Android Nerds, I like that. We have no idea. We don't know anything. But Russell Hawley does, and we will talk to him. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, <sighs> Freelancers and small business owners. I 
know that sometimes it feels like it's always tax time. There's stacks of receipts, spreadsheet formatting nightmares, and not enough time to deal with any of it. Now, our friends at FreshBooks have created ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software that makes dealing with your taxes way less taxing. Not a numbers person? That is not a problem. It is easy to get started. You can create and send invoices efficiently, plus get paid online quickly with FreshBooks payments. You also have the option to request a deposit in FreshBooks and get paid upfront. No more covering costs out of pockets or waiting until the end of a project to get paid. And they've made it incredibly easy for you to track your billable time. Okay, imagine this scenario. You have a client who's ready to pay, but then you have no way to accept their payment. You have to wait for them to get home so they can pay you from their computer. And then by the time they get home, they've conveniently forgotten that they had to pay you. This is why you will welcome the brand new FreshBooks card reader. This cute little device lets you connect directly to your tablet or your smartphone. Plus, you can keep your business safe and secure because it will accept the new standard chip credit card as well as the older magnetic stri stripe swipe cards. That is important, but forgetful clients will not ever evade you again. That is the best part. You can accept credit cards wherever business takes you quickly and securely with their entirely redesigned iPhone app, plus create beautiful invoices in just seconds. With FreshBooks, you can focus on what you love most, growing your business. You will wonder why you didn't start with FreshBooks sooner. Getting started is simple. It's totally free for 30 days. Go to freshbooks.com slash TNT and don't forget to enter tech news today in the how did you hear about us section. Start your 30-day free trial today, and we thank FreshBooks for supporting this episode of Tech News Today. All right, now joining us is a friend of the show, Russell Holly from Android Central. How's it going, Russell? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing awesome. It's great to get you on, uh, partially because you're awesome, but also because <laughs> it means you you bring with you gifts, uh, gifts of Android. Uh, Android folks were surprised with a new developer preview of Android this morning. But first things first, the really important stuff. Do we have a dessert name yet? No, we do not have an official <laughs> oh. dessert name yet. The closest that we've gotten uh, the, to, to anything that even resembles a name uh, is, is a little tiny teaser at the end of the announcement uh, for this, this event where it specifically said that the dessert name they weren't going to say but the, the way that it was phrased, uh, he said he was nut telling. Nut telling. Oh, oh okay. That, that's so. So it could be just it. be a really terrible joke, and it's not going to be Nutella at all. You know. Uh, but a lot of people are kind of hoping that it's Nutella. I, I, people I, really like a candy bar in a jar that you can spread on bread. So yeah, and I think it would it would I could see the icon in the in the corner, um, you know, of your notification bar. I could totally see it. Mm -hmm. uh, what it there's a ton of things that go with N though. So I mean, there's yeah. there's lots of things, and it was actually kind of one of the funny things that happened with Marshmallow. They did the, all of these like background videos when they launched mm -hmm. Marshmallow. Is it is not specifically desserts. Uh, the Android team refers to them as tasty treats. So it could actually be something healthy for you. Oh, okay, like a well, it couldn't be a carrot because that's C, but along those lines. <laughs> Something so vegetable, Something maybe a tasty vegetable. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, okay, so why so early? Normally, normally we're used to seeing these updates happen at Google I/O. That's not for I think a couple of months at this point. Uh, why are we suddenly being surprised by this? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. The the first is that Google I/O is going to be done in a really different format this year. You know, it's it's happening uh, down at the uh, the amphitheater instead of. Uh, you know, in the uh, the convention center, things are going to be broken out very differently. And, uh, you know, historically, we've gotten that announcement. And then, you know, 15 minutes later, the, the, the you know, schedule changes on, on the Google I.O. form to reveal all of these extra sessions for, uh, you know, the week to include all of these new things that they were hiding in order to, you know, keep the announcement secret. And they don't have to do that now, which means developers can better plan their schedules in order to to be in these sessions to get the questions that they need answered based on, you know, the information that they now have. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've got this kind of new version of Android. What are some of the kind of key features that people are, are highlighting right now? Well, on a, on a visual side, uh, we've got uh, big changes to the notification tray. Notifications look pretty different. There's a, a lot of things that are in line when it comes to, you know, interacting with notifications. Uh, you'll, you'll see things look a little different. It's really just, uh, you know, stylistic changes. When it comes to that, we've got uh, multi-window support uh, is now all over the place, both in phones and in tablets. And it looks really great on the uh, Pixel C as well as uh, on the 6P that I've tested it on so far. And those are those are the big, you know, visual changes that you'll see as you go through. the The launcher looks very similar. the The system tray uh, looks a little different when you scroll down the first time. 
Uh, you, you pull down on the, the notification tray, you'll see uh, power options across the top there where normally you would just see, you know, kind of the the icon widget and, and some of the time and stuff like that. And now when you pull down a second time, you have more of those options available to you. Uh, instead of only having them in that second window. Right, right. Um, and then I know that there's some uh, battery improvements. Now, part of Marshmallow was uh, this you know, feature called Doze, which helps to improve your battery when you're kind of not using the device. How is this being improved further? The explanation that we've gotten so far, it hasn't really been tested yet, uh, is that Doze is going to start working in, in kind of multiple stages now. Uh, and, and the first stage that we're going to see is when the display is off at all. Uh, and a big part of that is going to be, you know, the stopping, you know, apps from constantly reaching out and grabbing a hold of your Wi-Fi and, and you know, communicating when they shouldn't be. Uh, but it's not going to reach that deep sleep state until it's, you know, at rest like we have right now. Right. So right. this is just going to be this is like a like a separate stage to those. It's just kind of growing to, you know, keep apps in line a little more than uh, than what we have right now. Mm hmm. Um, where would you rate this as far as like a, a scale of experimental, you know, on the on the scale of being experimental for users? Like, does this not necessarily qualify for, let's say, the general consumer to to download? Because they've, they've actually kind of made some changes as far as how you can get updated to this. And I think that makes it kind of easier for people to get on board with the kind of the developer preview. Do you recommend that? No, not at all. Stuff is super broken right now. Uh, there, it's, there are a lot of things that are very cool. It's, it's very neat to kind of look at from afar, but when you do things like, uh, you know, have your, your launcher crash and come back to a screenshot as your wallpaper, like lots of really weird things are happening right now. And it's, this is what we saw last year too. There's actually going to be five different iterations to this developer preview, uh, as we move into the summer, uh, with, with, you know, bug fixes and new feature rollouts and, and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if you are planning on installing this, it is a lot easier to do so than it was in previous years. But but you really don't want to do it right now if you're doing it on a personal device. And and you probably are only going to do so if, if you're either just really interested in testing the new features or you're actually planning to develop against them. Yeah, I uh, my my knee jerk reaction anytime a new version of Android, be it experimental or not, is announced and released, is all right. Well, I'm just gonna you know do it on my on my personal device so that I'm really familiar with it. And of course, along with that comes a handful of uh, you know unintended consequences as a result. So thankfully, instead this time I'm not putting it on my Nexus 6P. I did, however, put it on my Pixel C, which I have right here. And I have kind of installed. Now, the Pixel C has seen a lot of criticism since it was released. This is Android's kind of uh, convertible tablet because you can remove this top top piece and it becomes a tablet or it snaps in and it's got the keyboard. It's seen a lot of criticism for being being made in the, in the sense that it would be good for kind of a multitasking uh, usage, like using it as a laptop, but that the software just really isn't, uh, isn't designed well enough to make it that good for multitasking do things like the split screen and stuff do that do those things actually improve the usage of the pixel c which i can actually show off while you talk about it yeah absolutely the the multitasking makes a huge difference the way that this is set up it, it uh you know makes a lot of changes as far as being able to just multitask very easily but it also fixes one of my biggest criticisms of the uh, the pixel c which was uh, having apps that would force rotation to uh to portrait when you've got it mounted uh, in in the keyboard like it is now mm -hmm. uh, apps like slack and instagram and things like that like ah. it was really just kind of a bummer uh to to get that forced uh forced rotation and there just wasn't anything you could do about it um and instagram is still broken uh, oh dang that, that was my go-to i was like oh cool <laughs> I, this always bugs me that, uh, but still, it's still that happens doing on it. an ipad too by the way uh, yeah it happens on everything except samsung tablets because they have multi-window and they can just push everything to the side and that's what will happen once this has been polished out is you'll be able to to reset the orientation to that split screen mode and it'll treat it as though it's in that uh that portrait uh, you know, setup, but it's it's one of those things that is going to require developers to uh, support over time. Google has done a lot of stuff to kind of force it so that it works with a bunch of stuff right now. Uh, but but in order to get you know the the real functionality with some of this uh, this stuff as we move into uh, Android N, it's going to require developers to to follow some of Google's instructions and and do stuff internally. And really, that's going to be a big part of uh, moving into N entirely. There there's so many 
you know, under the surface changes. We're going to have a really detailed analysis tomorrow of the stuff that we've seen so far. But, you know, the way that updates are handled, the way that, uh, you know, manufacturers are going to be pushing their own versions of Android. A lot of that stuff is going to change in very fundamental ways with with N. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of digging into it uh, leading up to next next week's show. One final thing. Pixel C was pretty... I don't know. It was a pretty high-end uh, tablet when it was released, even just a couple of months ago. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a price drop. What are, what are the details behind that? Well, developers can request a $150 uh, rebate, basically, uh, for for getting the tablet uh, on on the uh, the promise of you know offering feedback and and working with Android N on the tablet. And it's happening almost immediately. You can go and you can uh, you know request that discount and and you'll get an email you know with uh, with the approval for it, and then you can go through and, and place the order. Uh, and what you basically get out of that is the the keyboard for free. You know, because the keyboard is right around $150 right. and, and the physical keyboard makes a pretty significant difference in how you would use this tablet. So, you know, you can look at it one of two ways. You can look at it as, you know, now that it's been dropped to $350 or you can look at it as a free keyboard. I, I think it makes more sense to look at it as the free keyboard. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be a developer to be able to buy the Pixel C? Or do you have to be a developer yeah basically <laughs> they, they don't seem to be doing a whole lot in the way of checking okay. uh, you know so it's it's mostly just people who are paying attention and promising to offer feedback sure so you so you can get the discount too if you're a developer <laughs> Wait, in air price. quotes okay. sorry audio listeners <laughs> developer in air quotes uh well cool stuff i'm super excited about this russell holly it's always a pleasure getting you on the show thank you so much for coming on to kind of tell us a little bit about what people can look forward to with android n uh where can people find you online you can find me just about everywhere under uh, Russell Holly as my my tag for everything. I'm super boring that way, so uh, <laughs> pretty much anywhere you can find me. Boring's good. You're easy to find. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Uh, right on. Thank you so much, Russell. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, Take anytime. Care. After the break, Facebook wants us to learn the latest lingo before it hits the street. But yo. first, yo, that's not the latest. Oh. Lingo. First, let's take a minute <laughs> to thank ZipRecruiter, the sponsor of this episode. If you are hiring and you're not sure where to find the best candidates, ZipRecruiter is there for you. As a business owner, your company is only as good as the people you hire. You can post jobs in one place, but you probably won't find any good quality con candidates. And you're already short staffed, so who has the time to post to dozens of ch job sites? It's annoying. With ZipRecruiter, you can post to 100 plus job sites with one single click. It's like a robot keeps getting smarter. You'll instantly be matched to candidates from over nearly 6 million resumes. You just post one time and within 24 hours, you can watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. There'll be a plethora. There'll be so many candidates. It will be difficult for you to choose, but you will find the right ones. ZipRecruiter has been used by over 400,000 businesses and you can try it now for free. Getting the right people for your company is so important. It's the most important. Scott, a happy ZipRecruiter client said, the recruiting process used to be so painful before I'd post to several places, get a million resumes, but only a few responses from qualified candidates. It was torture. But with ZipRecruiter, we post once and get qualified candidates in one easy to review place. We've hired some of our best employees using ZipRecruiter. Thank you, Scott. Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of tech news today. Thank you, ZipRecruiter. <laughs> so Business Insider has a report that Facebook has applied for a patent designed to detect all the new words that your squad plans to use next. Yo. You know, with your squad goals. Mm-hmm. That's a thing. That's language that they use. <laughs> Squad goals. This, it, it could or could not be. I would not know, apparently. <laughs> yes. Actually, squad goals might be yesterday's news. That okay. might be already, right. like, not groovy anymore. I can, I can already tell this segment. Oh, boy. Uh, let's continue. <laughs> okay. The technology will scan the site and compile a social glossary so you can keep up with the latest slang. Yep. Uh, so this is only a patent. If you're uh, watching the video version, you can see um, how the neil, neil jisms. Neil jisms? I knew I was going to pronounce this. Neil Neologisms? Neolo neologisms. Neologisms. I even listen to Someone's it yelling at us before. right now, I can tell. Yeah, so I this is new words that come into, you know, into, into the, the language. So mm -hmm. uh, that sort of showed how, how that works. And they think, I mean, I think it makes sense that Facebook would be the place where you could figure out that squad goals was the right thing to say or the wrong thing to say. I have no idea. I just know that it, it, 
even even with all of this, I'm still going to sound lame if I try and say any of it. Uh, it's it's just not going to work for me. Um, so it's just a patent. So obviously that means mm -hmm. we it may yeah I know <laughs> we may or may not ever see it, but it's an interesting kind of goal. And I suppose in a in a social network like Facebook that revolves around so much conversation, uh, I suppose it benefits them to understand the conversation that's happening but isn't that kind of like why why is there analysis of that going on i don't i, I, I guess know. i don't understand the the purpose um yeah so you can be relevant i don't I, know I, is this aimed at us or is this aimed at keeping I facebook relevant as, kind of like what we we're talking right, about earlier before, with Kurt, right? everybody who uses facebook is about mm -hmm. to die and mm -hmm. you know the kids these days are all on the snapchat uh, uh so facebook just wants to be hip with the lingo yo <laughs> exactly right? mm -hmm. yes yeah so i use urban dictionary for that i don't know what okay. what you use well, you which and i wanted to share something i learned today that you might not know <laughs> uh the five second texting rule would you like to know what that is, I according don't know to what, Urban okay. Dictionary? There, there are a lot of bad things in Urban Dictionary. I'll just go ahead and say, so do I want to know what the five-second texting rule it's is? It's not dirty. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Here's right. the, this is the rule about uh, texting. You can send a double, you know what a double text is? Uh, where, you send the, where you send the same text two times accidentally to someone? No. Oh. A double text, according to Urban Dictionary, is you send a <laughs> Chris, text. Chris, our teleprompter then, operator, is rolling is his eyes at us. Yeah. it's a, Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I, it's a text and then you send another one. And the five-second rule is like you're only allowed to do that within five seconds. Otherwise, maybe you're new, too needy. Oh, Like if I'm like, Jason, okay. I need to talk to you. Jason? I need to talk to you. Jason? Yeah, Jason. Yeah, okay. Or like could, if I'm like, hey, yeah. how are you doing? And then 10 minutes later I say... How you doing? Or let's go have lunch. Then I'm desperate. <laughs> I may be completely wrong, but according to Urban Dictionary. I, I don't know, know. There's kids, a lot of giggles kids, happening in kids? the studio right now. Five second rule. <laughs> well, I I think I just learned something new. I, that's I don't my know goal. for sure. That I learned something. If you learned nothing <laughs> in this show. At least you learned that nothing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. All right. No I five think that's seconds. it. I don't know. Follow the five second rule of texting, my friends. All right. Uh, yeah, it does feel kind of needy if you send someone a text and then immediately send someone the same text mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm here. I'm here. Are you? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, anyways, I, I still have no idea what Facebook plans to do with this, if they oh. plan to do anything with it, but I suppose it's kind of interesting to pick apart the language and know the words that you that I should not be saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Squad goals. That was 2015. That Don't say it. <laughs> All righty. Uh, that is it for this week. Tomorrow's guest is going to be Steve Kovac from Business Insider. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can also leave us a short voicemail. Well, we don't get very many of those, but you should. But keep it short. 260-TNT-SHOW. You can find us on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. And if you happen to find yourself on iTunes, give us some stars. One, five, whatever you like. Ten. Uh, <laughs> you can't give ten stars oh. on iTunes. Uh, but I'm sure there's somewhere where you can give us ten stars. <laughs> and if you feel that we are, I, I don't know if we are worth it today. But on other days, we might have been worth that many yeah, stars. we're like a three today. I think. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, you can do that. And it helps people find our show. You can subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. You can subscribe to the newsletter at twit.tv slash newsletter. We're on Facebook at at uh, Tech News Today TV. At, at squad That's what we are. Leader. <laughs> no, no, uh, squad no. leader. No. no squad goals. Squad goals. I, Sorry. I, I'm still. I'm talking about Star, Star Wars. Yes. Apologies. No. I, I'm still on Twitter at, at Megan Maroney. And, and tweet me your slang if um, you have some because yeah. I need it apparently. Make, make Megan hip. <laughs> make me hip too. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director who is much hipper than we are, Kara Cole, and all the folks who help us produce the show every single day. They too are much hipper than we are. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you tomorrow. Yo.